Owning Regina, Audiobook, Part 5. Welcome to the podcast version of the lesbian romance novel Owning Regina, which is available in print and Kindle versions on Amazon.com. Additionally, Amazon.com will carry the unabridged audiobook version of the novel once it has been completed. If you are new to this podcast, please start with episode one so that you can enjoy the complete progression of the story. I'm Hunter Keenan, your narrator, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Owning Regina, Diary of My Unexpected Passion for Another Woman by Lorelei Elstrom. This diary has been fictionalized in order to protect the privacy of certain individuals. Though it may bear striking similarities to real life situations, people and relationships, any such depictions are purely coincidental. Saturday, March 31, Balance of Worlds. Last night, after Regina spooned me in bed, we were both asleep within two minutes and never woke up until morning. It had been a stellar day together, and sleeping never felt so natural. The sleep really did its job. I woke up first and quietly started writing here about yesterday while it was still fresh in my head. After a while, Regina awoke and ambled downstairs to see me. We both stared at each other in a warm buzz. It turned into a giggle drawn from all the crazy feelings we had both been having. When she laughed, her nose crinkled in the cutest way possible. We both felt entirely refreshed and anew. We decided to go out for a morning-after-fuck coffee. That's when lovers and one-night standers hit the cafes to relish the night before and get reacquainted in the daylight, usually in the same clothes as the night before. You know, two people with bedheads radiating afterglow toward each other. I asked her as myself, not as the mistress, if she would wear my thigh-high boots and a casual solid olive dress from my closet. She loved the idea and immediately got changed into it, looking like a Seattle vibe, kind of grungy and cool, but feminine. The thigh-high boots were a great accent, sexual, but not sexy or clubby. They had a rounded toe and a heavier heel. I generally hate stilettos because they always seem like trying too hard. The dress just barely covered the top of her boots, such that if she sat down and crossed her legs, the dress hemline would rise up just enough to reveal a slash of her buttery skin between the boots and the dress. The outfit gave her the look of a Paris model on her day off. As for me, I wore the same jeans and black top as last night, but instead of the flats, I tucked my jeans into our brick boots. And to tie both our outfits together, I came up with the ultimate accessory, her Vespa. Imagine two cool girls zipping around San Francisco in high boots on an electric Vespa. It's the photograph in Vanity Fair or Interview Magazine that we all want to be in. And now it was happening. When we got to her bike, she looked every bit as cool in real life as the picture was in my mind's eye. I got on the back of her bike and held her tight around the waist to complete the image. We were going to hit Rose's Cafe on Union Street. But once we started zipping around the city, by the time we got there, we didn't want to stop writing so soon. We were having a blast and being all goofy together. <laughs> we decided to cruise the city for a while. For kicks, we asked a few tourists where the Golden Gate Bridge was. We made faces to kids in car seats to crack them up, switching to a normal face when the parents would turn toward us. We got a few odd looks from people, too. Maybe they thought we were best friends zipping to an acting class. I wondered if anyone thought we were, in fact, a couple. When people see two women riding a motorcycle together, or holding hands for that matter, they generally think that the two women are best friends out having a fun time together. I doubt lesbian comes to mind right away. Even for me, whenever I would see two women out having a happy time together with a little physical contact, I would never think that there was more to the story. But that was before I met Regina. Now when I look around at paired girls in this city, I run scenarios in my head. Does that little one lick the bigger one's pussy while she's handcuffed and gagged? Are they straight like me and got hit with a love bug that suddenly turned them gay? Do they like it rough and nasty? Do their parents know about them? As of today, it's been exactly one month to the day that Boyfriend X stood me up on my birthday. Fucker. It has been one month to the day since I learned that I meant nothing to that self-absorbed douche who never got turned on by me. 
It was strange because wherever I went, guys would always flirt with me and light up when I walked into a room. Then once they started talking to me, understood that I have a career, understood that I make money, understood that I have a brain, my appearance suddenly seemed to dip on their rating scale. Sexy and feminine is hot, unless the woman is independent, enthusiastic, and thriving. Then she's just a plain threat to the penis. With BX, I never felt beautiful or desired. In a relationship, that sort of apathy toward a woman makes her play all kinds of mind games with herself. Am I ugly? Does he want someone younger? Do I have some lines or cellulite that turn him off? Do I deserve a less handsome guy that is more of a match for my appearance? Am I dating out of my range? Cut to Regina. She adores me and worships me. Well, maybe she adores me and worships her bitchy mistress. It's the exact opposite of BX's apathy. It's full pathy. Suddenly, I feel beautiful again. I feel sexy and self-assured. One month ago, my self-esteem was in the toilet. I doubted myself in a terrible way. The only partial remedy was to throw myself at my work and fill up every dark place with compliments from my coworkers and bonus paychecks from my inspired account handling. Now I'm a different person. My whole life is glowing. When I look in the mirror, I still see my flaws, but I see a face that somebody loves and wants. My imperfections become part of the rich experience of Meg instead of shameful reminders of her inadequacies. Regina makes me love myself. I couldn't help but wonder, what if a guy had treated me the way Regina does, adoring me and longing to spend another second together? Would I have ever met someone who inspires me to be my true self? Would I ever be able to throw myself sexually into a relationship without feeling ashamed about being kinky? Would I ever have considered crossing the stigmatized gender line to be with a woman? Whatever the case, a single month has brought the surprise of my life. I have discovered that being in love transcends gender and old models about how life is supposed to work. I know that sounds dopey and cliche, but I feel like a different person since meeting Regina. I have never felt freer or more in tune with my sexuality. She has no dick, but she has so much more. To share my kink with someone who doesn't judge me is the most amazing thing. She probably feels the same way. So there I was, holding tight on to Regina as we bopped around the city on her electric scooter, having the time of our lives. It felt like the most beautiful city on earth, vibrant and thrilling. We zipped over to the marina district, which immediately reconfirmed my love of the city. The fog was smothering the Golden Gate Bridge, but the sun was everywhere else. Alcatraz was winking at me in the sunbeams. Windsurfers and sailboats were zigzagging around the bay. I had a micro-fantasy of renting a sailboat and restraining Regina below the deck in the cabin while sharing drinks with a few friends on the deck as we sail the bay. Of course, the guests would have no idea my slave was on board. Every so often, I would disappear to the ladies' room where I would take a detour by the slaves' quarters to fondle, kiss, and torture Regina. Then I had another micro-fantasy about Alcatraz. See, when people are kinky like me, almost anything in daily life can kick you to a feverish lust. So, about Alcatraz. I'd love to be mega rich and rent the island for a full week. I would drag Regina into that compound in manacles and shackles. I could lock her up in the darkest cell and be her fucked up prison guard. She would have to sleep on the cold concrete floor with no blankets and her neck chained to the floor. Occasionally, I would enter through the giant iron door and give her a meal of plain rice after she polished my boots with her tongue and begged for a bite to eat. Sometimes I would take her to my warden quarters and lavish her with a two-hour vacation of a hot shower, toasty flannel jammies, a cheese plate, and a bottle of Merlot. And I would rub her delicately and show her the softest side of my warden personality. Then it would be off to her cell again. 
where she would have no light and would not know whether it was night or day. She would not know if she would ever escape. I would be her lifeline to human touch. I would own her. Fantasy over as she commented, shit, we're running out of the charge on my scooter. We better stop for breakfast and charge up. So we crossed our fingers and hoped to make it to Rose's cafe. Too bad. The bike pooped out two blocks away at Greenwich and Fillmore. We'll push it, she resolved. We both got off the bike, two cute girls in high boots and bedhead hair, and began to push the bike. I immediately jumped in to take over. She had no business looking that beautiful and pushing a motorcycle. But I wasn't pushing for just three seconds when a fine gentleman from the street, briefcase in hand, jumped to our rescue. He said if we wouldn't mind holding his briefcase, he would push the bike. And so it went. It seemed like the sight of two girls, a dead bike, and a businessman was an interesting sight. We got a few looks. After a few minutes, we made it to Union Street. We would be able to coast downhill the last block to the cafe. We rubbed the guy's ego a bit with our feminine wiles, and he was on his way with a smile. Oh, and he turned around for one parting shot directed toward Regina. Your boots are magnificent. Absolutely great. Regina responded through a coy smile. Thank you. I borrowed them from her, pointing to me. She has a boot fetish and wanted to see me in them. The guy delighted in trying to process this, then gave a wave and was off. The kindness of strangers. We hopped on the bike and rolled a little above walking speed down the slight grade to the cafe. I asked Regina what we were supposed to do with the bike after breakfast. She said, no worries, watch. She lifted the seat to reveal a little compartment which held a 75-foot extension cord. She grabbed the plug and sauntered into the cafe. A moment later, she came out with a plug in hand and a telling smile. The bike could charge while we dined, and then we would have enough juice to make it to my house for a proper charge. Once we were seated and ordered, Regina had a request. Meg, let's not talk about the weather here, okay? Why? Is something wrong? Are we cool? Everything's great. I'm in heaven with you. I love being your object. I love the game. It's like yoga. I love it so much. But you can't do yoga all day, or dessert for that matter. I get you. And maybe I'm a little afraid of losing you to the mistress. I need both of you, not just one or the other. And I need both of you. But I'm extra horny these days because you've come to my sexual rescue and allowed me to experience a fullness that I've never known in my life. Thanks, Regina. I leaned over and kissed her briefly on the lips. That one little kiss sent the electricity of hope and caring through my whole body. I was in love with this woman. She must have felt the same thing because she took my hand from the table and held it close to her cheek as if she was hugging me dearly. Hello, girls, interrupted an unknown male voice from the side table. We turned to see a couple of lads looking at us with pickup lines ready to roll off their tongues. They were a couple of dot-commers, you know, in their 20s and loaded with stock options about to go public in a major way. I was able to size them up so quickly because they were very confident, but very nerdy, and accessorized on the high end. One's shoes were the kind of leather booties that felt like Neiman Marcus. The other had designer prescription glasses and a tag hewer watch. Dot-commers like these have just enough moxie to come out with this. Say, would you two like to have some lunch guests? Neiman's shoes chimed in. And by guests, he means we'll pick up a tab. Regina and I shot each other a look and approved the deal in our glance. We simultaneously gestured for them to pull up chairs. Neiman's shoes continued. I'm Josh. This is Dave. Pleasure. Hey, we saw you on the scooter and thought we should stop by to say hi. We're glad you did. How about a bottle of wine for the table? It's lunchtime. I think we'll pass. Is your name Wi-Fi? Because I'm feeling a connection. (laughs) Yeah, I'm feeling it. As strong as a dial-up modem. (laughs) Just kidding. Sure, pull up a chair. Actually, I didn't give her permission for that. What are you, her owner? As a matter of fact, she is. She owns you? Yes, she certainly does. You mean you're her boss? In a matter of speaking, yes. She even told me what to wear today. She has a boot fetish. Wow, okay. 
All right. Well, how about you ask your boss if you can uh, give me your phone number? <laughs> awesome. You can come over and give us both back rubs. We're a couple. You should have seen both guys' eyes widen. They were a little embarrassed, too. But Josh was quick on his feet to save face. Right. Um, and an amazing-looking couple you are. Too bad people like us will never get to shower you with the man's love you deserve. Thanks. We'll enjoy showering together instead. She's not really my boss. You can't own a person. <laughs> Either way, you two are just gorgeous. Your beauty rivals the graphics in, like, Call of Duty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have an idea. Let's get the waiter to take our pictures together. You two can Instagram it and tell everyone you had a great lunch date. Both guys were overjoyed at the proposition. We all got up and stood by the table. Josh flagged down a waiter and handed him a phone to take the picture. We used all our feminine allure to make this a photo that any guy, especially dot-comers, would be thrilled to show their friends. They could put it on their office corkboard. Cheese! And the picture was snapped. The boys thanked us profusely, then headed out. We sat back down to continue our meal and conversation. I bet those fuckers are rich. Did it give you pause? Would you want to be with a guy like that? I would be a whore. There would be no reason in the world to be with a person like that. I would never fit. I could never be emotionally or sexually satisfied. Me neither. After the meal, we thought we should split up for the rest of the day. She had laundry to do, and I had to take care of some errands. We could have done everything together, but I think we were both feeling like a little air between us would be good. It's super important for everyone to have their own space. Besides, we'd had a pretty incredible and intense few days, and there was no way we could keep that pace up without flaming out in our lives outside the relationship. She unplugged the extension cord, and we headed out on her bike with a nice new charge. When she dropped me off, we both got a little melancholy and decided to have dinner out together, making a promise not to play the game or end up at either of our homes together. Dinner would just be Regina and I catching up. The mistress would have to stay home and pout. I finished doing my errands and paying a few bills, still buzzing with thoughts of Regina. It was a pretty warm day, which is funny because Regina had been wearing thigh-high boots. So I thought I'd hit the beach and crash on a blanket. I went to Ocean Beach. First, I took a long walk along the water, then put out a blanket and crashed out. Everything felt cheery and magical. I was asleep in just a couple of minutes. I must have slept a really long time because I woke up freezing from a foggy breeze coming in. I checked the time and found out it was almost 6 p.m. I was supposed to meet Regina at 7. Shit! I raced home as fast as I could and jumped in the shower at 6.28 to wash off the sand. At 6.50, I called Regina to let her know I was running a tad late. She was already at the restaurant. Well, it wasn't really a restaurant. We were meeting at Steep Brew, a basic burger Americana pub at 17th and Rhode Island Street. We thought a mundane place would be less sexually charged than a fancy romantic joint. I zipped over there as fast as possible and made it just about 12 minutes late. Hey, stranger, she welcomed. We hugged and I sat down. It's funny. We had been so intimate and exposed to each other in private that now it almost felt like we were college roomies meeting after five years apart. It was like war buddies getting together later. We had to reacquaint ourselves with each other in the light of the everyday world. Clearly, we still had a giant chemistry toward each other, but we both wondered if there was more to explore with each other than kink. We bounced back and forth with some meaningless small talk while trying to size each other's personalities up. Would we be best friends if we had ever explored kink together? My question would be answered within the first five minutes of ordering. We were at a table where my side was the booth and Regina's side was a chair. Regina left her chair and came over to park on my side in the booth, scooting in as tight as she could to me. 
That quasi-awkward start across the table only turned out to be the result of two people with entirely different lives suddenly trying to merge with someone new. Surprisingly to me, being close to her physically in that moment was a much stronger feeling than my fear about being seen in public with a girl. It was that same excitement I remember feeling in junior high when I went out on a date with a guy I really liked and he put his arm around me. It was shocking that someone could actually like me enough to hold me in public and not be ashamed or nervous that it would damage their reputation. Maybe it's just my self-esteem, but I've often felt like an imposter in cases like that. You know, they must think I'm someone else from my facade, or maybe they wouldn't be so affectionate in public if they knew the real me inside. I was always fine in public as the life of the party, the hot girl in the black dress who would do daring things. But when things got up close and personal, I tended to be less confident. For me, it's always been easier to fuck like a whore than to have someone hold my hand. In retrospect, I think I also felt like my kink was shameful and could never be revealed. So in a sense, I was somewhat shallow with people who were interested in me. I didn't want them to know that there was something wrong with me. But there I was with Regina. She had primed the pump by sitting so close to me, and suddenly I felt safe to reciprocate the touching. I was rubbing her neck and ear as we chatted about the vanilla parts of our lives. She told me how Tucker is really complex. He has an amazing sensitive side, super empathetic. He writes poems like this one Regina pulled out of her purse to read to me. Love is a triangle between a healthy body, a healthy soul, and a friendly smile. Love is mommy when she reads to me and looks at me. Remember, this kid is only nine. Regina said it's really common for him to write and say things like this, and he doesn't always focus them on her. He tends to exude this sensitivity that seems out of place for a kid his age. But Regina went on to describe how he's complex. While he does have this extremely sensitive side, he also has a bit of a self-righteous streak. It is common for him to put others down and judge others. For example, Regina says Tucker often says stuff like, that guy is a big fat gut. He shouldn't be drinking that soda. So Tucker has this yin-yang thing that seems a little extreme on either side. Regina tries to never talk about people pejoratively or in a judgmental way, and she didn't remember her ex doing it either. She thinks it's the way Tucker is coping with a divorce somehow. But he does well in school and seems to have balance, so she isn't worried about him. After explaining all this about Tucker, she hit me with a zinger. Can you believe how blue the sky was today? Shit! I was coming to terms with trying to be close to this woman, and she has to haul off and start playing the game. I really wanted to be with Regina, not that fucking slave. I wasn't in the mood. We never came up with rules about what to do when one person wants to play the game and the other doesn't. Great. Frustrated and being yanked out of my warm and fuzzy bubble, I scoffed as the mistress. What do you want? This had better be good. Regina, I mean the slave, apologized for bothering me, but said she wanted to give me a present. She handed over a box with a bow on it. I opened it to discover a very expensive-looking black leather corset. This was the kind of corset that was functional, not just lingerie. It was boned and had a very stiff feel that could easily be laced up tightly to constrict breathing and also substantially suck in one's waist. I always thought those corsets were sexy and feminine, especially when they were the real thing like this one. A flimsy little lace one wouldn't do it for me. Regina looked at me for approval of the gift she had given me. I wasn't quite sure how to react, so I just decided to be honest. Come with me, I commanded, leading her to the bathroom. She followed me across the restaurant and into the single toilet bathroom where I locked the door behind us. I took off my top and bra and held the corset in place under my bare skin. Lace it up, I told her. The corset was foreign to both of us and she struggled for a moment to figure out the lacing in the back. But it wasn't long before I felt the leather tightening up to my tummy. Corsets are designed to be laced from the center first, then tighten outward from the middle. She was really cinching my stomach, and I was literally feeling constricted. She heard my groans growing as the tightness increased toward discomfort. She had the awareness of my discomfort and finally started moving outward on the lacing. The corset was pulling in around my chest and also around my lower back, and I was getting turned on. It was a half-cup corset and gently lifted my breasts up as it got tighter. 
My nipples were exposed just above the top of the leather. When Regina got everything about as tight as I could stand it, she tied off the balance of the string firmly around my waist. The thing about a corset is that the more you tighten, the more leftover string there is when you're done. I would say there was at least five feet of extra string when I was all cinched in. I could actually feel my pussy getting wet for the mere act of being constricted by Regina. It felt like no kind of bondage I could imagine. I felt solid and powerful, even though every single bit of my torso was compressed beyond comfort. It's kind of like heels that make me feel strong, even though technically they make a woman more vulnerable. I looked in the mirror as Regina watched on. It was clear that this was definitely a great look on me, although maybe not the greatest look with my yoga pants. I wanted to enjoy the appearance a bit. She was standing behind me and I told her to put her hands around my corseted waist and show me that she adores me. Her arms went around and she hugged me close from behind. She began kissing my neck as I watched in the mirror. It was unbelievably sexy to see her delicate hands on the dark leather as she licked and kissed my neck. Either she got bolder or lost herself in the sensuality of the moment, but she started playing with my nipples just above the corset. It was super hot to watch. She was really in touch with me and quickly read my mind that I wanted her to finger me. With one hand on my nipple, she used the other hand to stimulate me where I was aching for touch. Simultaneously, she had moved from kissing my neck to alternately focusing on my ear and mouth. As for me, I was just taking it all in, spying from the mirror. I felt like I was someone else watching. It was a sexy movie in the mirror. But things escalated quickly as she played with my clitoris and gently fingered me under my yoga pants. For real, the corset made it hard to breathe. I was short of breath and it got worse and I got more turned on. Just then, Regina shocked me by slipping her left hand over my mouth and pulling in tight while pinching my nose to cut off my breathing. I was suffocating and writhing under her touch and started to come violently. The whole time I was coming, she kept her hand over my mouth and nose. It was a burning orgasm that took me to places I had never been before. I was weak, suffocating, and could hardly stand. She sensed when I was finished and removed her hand from my mouth. I gasped with all my might for air and kept panting desperately. She softly hugged me as I gradually came down. Keep in mind, the entire time we were in the bathroom, the only words spoken were, lace it up. The silence stood to heighten the sensuality of everything that was going on. Finally calming down, I turned around and hugged her with incredibly warm feelings. She smiled softly, realizing that her gift was a success with her mistress. We kissed for a long time. There was such a connection to the moment, to each other. I broke the silence by softly speaking. You're a very thoughtful slave. You will be rewarded. Then we kissed again before separating. It was a strange scene because she had dominated me, but the mistress didn't seem to mind. It all happened organically. The slave had been suffocating and fondling the mistress. I guess sometimes you have to turn the other cheek when a slave is being presumptuous or disrespectful. It's a matter of picking one's battles. I put my top over the corset because I really wanted to keep it on. With no bra, my erect nipples were super visible through the fabric. Also, the fact that my boobs were pushed up was adding to the effect. Oh well, people would just have to deal with my nipples. The corset felt amazing, and I was certainly not going to do anything to stop that feeling. We walked out of the bathroom, and there was a line of three girls that were waiting. Oops. They looked at us and clearly knew that we were up to something in there. When we were walking back to our table, I felt the swagger of a real dominatrix. That corset is like a cape to Superman. It gives powers. Regina was beaming as we sat back down. I decided to fuck with her. Did you give me that corset because you think I'm fat? A look of horror came over her as she quickly defended, Mistress, not at all. I merely wanted to give you a gift that I thought you would like. 
I gave her a disapproving look with, fine, then I accept your gift. But you are never going to bribe me into being soft with you. And I grabbed her face firmly. Do you understand? She answered timidly, yes, mistress. And then I put a stop to the madness with, that was some kind of crazy day I had. We both shifted emotional gears. It took a few moments because we were so in the zone. And there we were, together again as ourselves. I was emotionally naked and unguarded as possible when the following words flowed from my mouth unconsciously. I'm in love with you. Regina blushed. The girl who had just been suffocating me and rubbing my pussy was now blushing. It was really cute. Then I remarked how the corset was really uncomfortable, still being so tight. We both laughed. So much for a casual meeting without kink. After more sharing about our regular lives outside, she surprised me by blurting out, your breasts are beautiful. And now I was the one blushing. Guys always said that to me, but it felt so different hearing those words from a girl. It felt sweet and sexy rather than lusty. From anybody else, I tend to brush off compliments like that. But with Regina, I felt like it was real enough to take in and enjoy. We finished up with some airy conversation about plans for next week, Tucker's schedule, and which grocery store we each liked, all while holding hands on the table. After bussing our table like good girls, we said our goodbyes, each with an inside glow that was moving us happily on our separate ways toward home. But before we actually left each other, I pulled her in close and honestly said, Regina, I love my corset. Thank you so much. Regina, realizing we were not in the game, flashed a heartfelt smile with, You're welcome. Even though the mistress's slave had given the gift, I was the one thanking Regina outside of the game. This was peculiar because it clearly showed how complex emotions and sexuality can be. I was thanking her, as a person, for doing something nice for me. It wasn't a sexual thing. In fact, I couldn't wait to get the corset off of me. It's super uncomfortable outside the game. The kink helps to compartmentalize the sex from the rest so that we can share on a deeper level in both worlds. The sex is supercharged and insane while the rest is so completely human. That's why it was odd that I felt like thanking Regina for the corset in real life. The corset was from another world, but the gift was from Regina, and I had to reconcile all this within my feelings. One thing was clear though, the real gift was Regina. We said goodnight and headed out. Thank you for listening to this episode of Owning Regina. Music was provided by Josh Woodward. Additional music provided courtesy of Jazar. The character of Regina was played by Daniela Flynn. The character of Josh was played by Bill Garcia. If you like this podcast, please give a favorable review on iTunes. Or follow the author on Twitter at Elstrom L. That's Elstrom and the letter L. Additional information about the book can be found at Amazon.com.